you're standing between people and their lunch. <laughs> although, although I told him, I do this every week. I mean, you understand that that's exactly what happens every Sunday morning is that the preacher stands between people and lunch. It's not a great position to be in. But uh, people are generally quite tolerant and uh, agreeable about all that. And certainly, uh, you had a choice to be someplace else today. This is not a captive audience, and so the fact that you've chosen to be here suggests to me that you care more about this uh, than you do other things. I appreciate that very much. I want us to start thinking about making a local impact. <clears throat> and the truth matters, one might reasonably argue that it's the only impact you can make. Uh, you, have the, you have the capacity to make an impact on other people who are within your sphere of influence, and I appreciate what Carrie was just talking about. Uh, bad news for you, if you want to think about it in this way, is that that means that you are the tip of the spear. That Carrie and to some degree Chuck, there are certain limitations on what they can do, but there are no limitations on what you can do collectively. In other words, that the number, of, if we just sat down, and we're obviously not going to take the time to do that, if we just sat down and just started writing a list of all of the folks outside of Christ that you know, and you have your list, maybe you know 50, maybe you know 100, maybe you know 500. Uh, there would be some duplicates, some overlaps between your list and somebody else's, but I just wonder if we could hazard a guess at how many discrete, how many different people that we have some kind of relationship with collectively that are not Christians. I bet the number's 5,000. Okay? So don't talk to me about limitations. We've got a huge opportunity represented by the relationships that we already have. When we went to Slovakia, the first job, and I'll talk about this in just a few minutes, uh, is figuring out who you're going to talk to because you know nobody. But we don't have to start there. We get to start at least one step ahead. Contact generation is the first and greatest, challenges, greatest challenge that most people in ministry face. How do I get to know people with whom I can develop an evangelistic relationship? You already have that list of people. So let's talk about getting started. Uh, how, do we, how do we actually make the move toward making something happen? I, I suggest that the first thing to do might be to ask questions. Uh, Chuck said, you know, we've got to listen to people. Well, that's true on the micro level. In other words, when I'm with one person, I need to listen. But also, I need to step back and ask questions and listen to the answers that, uh, to those questions as I think about devising some kind of an approach. And the first question that I want to ask is, what are the challenges? Uh, Chuck really dealt with this to some degree, again, on a personal level in his last presentation. One of the challenges is that people say no sometimes. Okay? Uh, is it true that in some places and some circumstances, some people are more likely to say no than others? Yeah, so there are, there are certain receptive populations. Chuck mentioned this as well. When you, when you have somebody that says no, and there's pretty clear emphasis they're not a seeker, then you've identified a non-receptive person. And you want to spend more of your time on responsive people. Okay? Uh, that's true not only at the level of the individual hour, it's also sometimes true in certain populations. For example, if you find yourself primarily surrounded by people who are rather affluent, it has been documented over and over and over again that people who are more fluent, they're wealthier, tend to have less of a perception of their own need and are therefore frequently or less receptive. Now that does not mean they don't need the gospel and that you shouldn't be talking to them. You definitely should. But if you say, who's around me right now? Is this a population of people that is more likely to be responsive or more likely to be resistant? It's a question that you can ask. So, what are the challenges? Uh, you might ask, by the way, there could be personal challenges as well. You know, when God called Moses to be his spokesperson, Moses said, you know, I really stink at that kind of thing. Well, God says, okay, I understand that challenge. Now, shut up, do what I told you to do. But nonetheless, uh, I'll, I'll identify some response to that. I'll have Aaron help you. He's better at that than you are. I acknowledge that. So, what are the challenges? And then, what are the opportunities? Uh, is there something about where we are? as in our, in our local congregation, whether you're at this congregation or one of the others around, is there something about that that uniquely positions us to do something very, very helpful? For example, one of my friends and co-workers, Doug Burleson, worked in Baton Rouge, Louisiana when Hurricane Katrina came through. Okay? 
Boy, what a challenge, but also what an opportunity. That church was extremely well placed to really make a difference in people's lives at that moment. Is there some, now, the thing that we're dealing with may not be as catastrophic as that. Uh, Carrie was mentioning last night in one of our casual conversations that this is a great place to live because some of the things that other people have to deal with, you just don't have to deal with here. The insurance rates are lower because there's less natural disaster that takes place. You're not in Tornado Alley. There's no hurricane that's going to reach Michigan. You know. I meant home insurance rates. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that clarification. Yeah, home insurance rates. I understand your automobile rates are, are terrible and other things like that. But yeah, home insurance rates are low because you don't have those kinds of things to deal with. But are there other things that are unique to your setting? Have you ever? Th it's, it's really hard to see our own home setting with the eyes of a visitor or guest. Okay? Uh, it's just difficult. It's you know, Kerry comes here from someplace else and he's going to have a certain view of this community that's going to be different than the view that some of you have lived here pretty much all your lives have. So uh, ask somebody to help you take a look at yourself and your situation through a fresh set of eyes. What does that look like to them? But then acknowledge that you have a view of yourself that somebody who comes in from outside could not possibly have. What can we do? What are the opportunities? What do I know about us that makes us especially well positioned to be able to make a difference. What's special about our situation? Um, this, every congregation is unique. Every community is unique. You know, I'm a student of culture. Um, anthropologists categorize things on the basis of certain questions that they might ask, but in the end, there are no two identical situations. So ask yourself, what's special about our circumstances as a congregation, and then what's special about my particular circumstance? Who do I know that nobody else knows? Uh, what about my personality? What about the personalities of the people that I work with? What are, what's special about my situation? Are there particular categories of people that we'd like to reach? You may, you may have noticed in, one of my, in my previous session this morning that I talked about goal setting. And I, when we been, we were, I, for some reason or another, in my mind, of all the goal setting sessions that I've ever been a part of, and there have been several, the one in 1995 and our mission team in Bratislava, Slovakia sticks in my mind. And uh, we set out to establish 10 goals for the following year. Uh, several of those, I'm sure, were good, but one of the, out of those 10 goals in that one particular situation, one of them sticks in my mind, and I mentioned it this morning. We set out as one of our goals to establish evangelistic relationships with 10 families between the age of 25 and 40. Now, why did we do that? Is it because we liked 25 through 40-year-olds better than others? No. Uh, now, the truth of the matter is most of us were within the ages of 25 to 40 at that time. I was squarely within that. Most of us were. But that's not right why we identified that that population. We identified that population because that was an area where there was a hole in our church. We had some older folks and we had some younger folks who had come along as a result of some of our classes, but we had almost no complete families in that age range. Our church needed that. They provide a balance between stability and energy that we felt the church there in Bratislava really needed. And so we targeted that group of people. We also targeted simply because most of us were that age, meaning that we had the capacity to interact and identify with them, and perhaps maybe they could identify with us. So we needed to do that, and we set up our goal in that way, not because, certainly, if I had a chance to study the Bible with anybody, I would do it. But I'm thinking about specific ways to try to target a population that I felt like really needed to be engaged and had not been fully engaged, apparently, up until that time. And so that was a goal that we made. We identified a particular population. Uh, name for me some other specific populations that you might think we, we could reach out to. Uh, some of these things, I'll, get, I'll, I'll prime the pump just a little bit here by mentioning things like, you might say, oh, we have a population of immigrants that's moved in recently. Maybe there's a Hispanic population or an Asian population. You think, those folks need the gospel. Let's target that group of people. Uh, people in transition. New, people who come new to a community are about three times as likely to consider a new religion 
as somebody who's been in the community for a while has already settled into something. Maybe we want to target that kind of population. Are there others that you can think of that you can say, okay, we're going to give special attention? College. All right, we may say, well, there's, a, there's a, these colleges nearby. Uh, we want to we reach out to people because you've got a transient population, people coming in and out, and they're at a developmentally important time in their lives. So you could choose to target that population. Others? Could you do something for people who are struggling economically? Could we help those folks? See, it's just ask. The answer may be that you don't want to specialize in any way, but just going through the thought process opens your eyes to possibilities that are outside of your norms, and that's really when you become more stimulated to try new things. Okay? Did somebody else say something? I'll make sure I don't... Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If there's a, if there's a homeless population... Yeah, how do, we, how do we reach out to that homeless population or others who need special care? And that? Will we be that kind of church that, that brings the invisible people out of the shadows? In some communities, there's what they call a uh, welcome like in tech program. Right. Yeah, you can use those kinds of strategies, especially to reach out to these new people in the community and things. It, but you, the point is that you make a conscious decision to sharpen the tip of the spear just a little bit for the purpose of getting someplace that you haven't gotten before or for exploiting, and I don't, I'm not using that word hopefully in a, in a negative sense, I understand it's come to be used a bit pejoratively, but exploit or take advantage of a reality that you have observed that gives you an opportunity. Remember, you've heard this phrase before I suspect, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you always got. It's, it's a trap. We're all very susceptible to it, but if we want something to change, we have to start asking some questions. We have to start subjecting our situation to some critical inspection. Bring it out of the shadows into the light. Uh, challenge the status quo just a little bit. All right, so the next step, and I'm thinking about this kind of globally. Remember, my job is to think about the big picture, the principles and things like that, and Chuck's going to talk about the practices much more than I do. But so we start out by asking questions. Let's, just, let's survey our situation. And then we need to think about resources. Okay, sometimes I talk to churches about either leadership or missions or church growth. And I, I want to kind of start on a process. And I'll say, okay, um, here's what we frequently do. We say, okay, we've got X number of dollars. Let's say we've got $40,000 this year that could be spent on evangelism. How much... How much salvation can you buy for $40,000? Now, we would never say that overtly like I just did. It sounds weird when you say it, but that's kind of how we approach it. We frequently start by saying, what have we got to spend and how much can we get for that? Can I just suggest that that's backwards? Money follows ministry. Money follows ministry. The first question we ought to be asking is, what can we do? And then we start asking, what have we got to do it with? And now, you think to yourself, but doesn't that come up with the same result? No, because there's no limitation here. We're, we're asking first what needs to be done. And if we get excited enough about what needs to be done, it's amazing how often we can assemble the resources necessary to do it. We do this in our own personal lives, don't you? If you really care about something, you find ways to do it. It's just, we just do that. And so start by asking the questions. What opportunities are out there? If, if resources were no... You hear people say this all the time. If money was no object, I would... And they fill in the blank with some really neat thing that they would do. Okay, first, talk about what could be done without any reference to how realistic or achievable it is at all financially. Then, start asking about resources. And this is, by the way, not about money. Okay, it's partially about money. But it's just not completely about money. There are financial resources that are needed to do some things, but I already told you this morning, evangelism is a free activity. But there are financial resources. If you feel like, you know, back, then, back during the 60s and 70s, we had all these bus ministries down south. I don't know if they did things like that up here. Okay. Uh, we did that. Well, that requires some resources financially, right? You've got to get the buses and you've got to keep them up and, and all those kinds of things. So there are some financial resources. If our evangelism results in larger numbers of people here, we might have some physical plant sorts of things that we'll need to consider. Money follows ministry, though. 
Start first with what we need to do, then ask about financial resources. Listen, how we distribute our financial resources says more about us sometimes than we would be willing to admit. Jesus said it, didn't He? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Um, are we willing? Do we care enough about these things to prioritize them? To, or are we going to build something else on our church building that keeps the saved comfortable? Or are we going to choose to allocate our funding in a way that is more likely to reach out to others? You choose. Financial resources are allocated on the basis of what our values are. Sometimes that convicts me. I do not like to have to admit what I sometimes see about the way that I spend my money. That's true in the church. It's true in my personal life as well. Maybe you haven't had that issue before, but I really, really have. All right, but that's not the only kinds of resources. Remember, an awful lot of what produced local growth cost very little, as I've already indicated. But there are also human resources. Um, if something needs to be done and it needs human power to do, then we want to ask, what are the resources at our disposal? Now, I am not naive. Okay, I'm kind of naive. Uh, I hope in an idealistic sort of positive way. I mean, even, even my blood type is B positive. But... <laughs> Uh, my dad's type is O negative. I, that probably explains a lot. At any rate, uh, but I'm not naive in this sense. I know as much as I would like, let's just put it this way, it has never been demonstrated in a single church that I've ever been a part of that we could get 100% of the people involved in the things the church really ought to be doing. I've never seen that done. Boy, would I love to see it. But here we are. The people who are gathered in this room right now represent a starting point for human resources for anything that this church might want to do. The churches of which you are part want to do something. You people are among the seed for that. So I ask, what do we have available to us? Particularly if we want to do a certain thing that requires a specific kind of person. Do we have the kind of people needed to do that? Now, if we have them naturally, that's great. There are some people who are just good at certain kinds of things. But it may be that what needs to happen, and this always happens among people who work in human resources, they talk about what we've got and what we can develop. All right? Sometimes people need more training. That's part of what this is about. Sometimes people need some exhortation. Sometimes they need some uh, good kick in the pants or whatever. You know, they just need somebody to kind of say, hey, you know, you don't know this yet, but I think you'd be great at this. So think about the human resources. If there's an opportunity and you need resources, then what are those? Uh, people's talents obviously fit into this category. What is it that people are good at? Uh, you need the numbers and higher and higher levels of involvement as ministry grows. It is unrealistic to want to do more and more and more with the same small group of people. Even when the group is this size. This is a, you know, Jesus took the world with 12 guys. What could we do with this bunch? Who knows? But I'll just say this, realistically speaking, if your life is already full with the stuff that you're currently doing, you have two choices if you want to do something new. You can stop doing something you're already doing and add this other thing instead, or you can add more people into the resource force. These are the only two options that you have. Now, maybe some of both of those need to happen. Maybe you're doing some stuff that you don't need to do. Uh, I'm talking about maybe in your personal life. Maybe you need to stop being, maybe I need to stop spending so much time on X that has absolutely no noticeable spiritual impact and more time on Y, which gives me more opportunity for spiritual impact. Maybe I need to make that tough choice. I suspect many, I know I waste a lot of time. Now, not all time that's spent in no, not overtly religious activities is wasted. Relationships with other people that get you in their lives and give you an opportunity to have influence on them are not wasted times at all. When we uh, went to Slovakia, the other couple that are good friends of ours, matter of fact, my wife is with the lady right now in Oklahoma. <clears throat> um, when they got there before us, the, the people who sent them said, we want you to get a car, even though most people don't have a car, because we don't want, your t want you wasting your time standing around at bus stops. Now that reflects a very American point of view, time spent standing at bus stops is wasted. We want to be efficient. The problem is, time spent at bus stops is not necessarily wasted. 
This is time when you're rubbing shoulders with people, the very people that you came to that country in order to try to get to know so you could teach them the gospel. So we need to be careful that we don't think that something is a waste of time just because it's not overtly evangelistic. At the same time, we may, may need to be challenged. We have filled our lives up with all kinds of stuff. And sometimes we are just up to about right here. And there's no time to add things which are more fruitful and more blessed than that. So that's true. But it's also true we need to think about higher levels of involvement. Uh, what would, if we could do X with this group of people, is it possible that we could do 2X if we had twice this many people? I'm not good at math, but I think that works. Uh, so we need numbers and involvement. And then we need an outreach mentality. Uh, let me tell you something interesting about this. Uh, when we went to Slovakia, there was a little congregation in Parsons, Tennessee that agreed to be our overseeing congregation. We had 14 congregations and individuals help out with our funding. Now, some of them knew us previously, some of them didn't. And the church there at Parsons, the, I was preaching in a little congregation about five miles away. I was in graduate school. And my friend Sid Dye was preaching at the, uh, at the Parsons church. And he said, Mark, you're getting ready to go to Slovakia, Czechoslovakia at that time. He said, Parsons needs to be your overseeing congregation. They know you and we need to be more involved in missions. So we got together and, and uh, worked to, to have those kinds of conversations. And that group of men who had never, it was a great combination. Uh, they'd never overseen a missionary before and I'd never been a missionary before. Why that's a great combination, I do not know. Having that much ignorance all gathered in one place is not normally good. <laughs> but, but for whatever reason, it just worked. They were great to us. And, you know, an interesting thing happened because, there, and we're talking about a congregation of about 100, no, about 95 people at that time. So it's not a big congregation at all. So they really took, it took an act of faith for them to agree to accept responsibility for a work 5,000 miles away from where they were. But they did. And an interesting thing happened. During the five years that they supported us, 5,000 miles away, that congregation grew from 95 to 140 during that period of time in a place where there's already a high level of saturation in churches. And why did that happen? Well, because they began to think of themselves differently. They weren't just keeping house anymore. They were evangelistic. They were partnering with the black welders and taking the gospel 5,000 miles away. And if they could take it 5,000 miles away, they might could take it five miles away. And they did. There was no major program that was added. They didn't hire a new preacher. No, no big event took place. They just started thinking differently about what it means to be a Christian. And it had an impact. Suddenly now they have resources and they were them. They didn't even realize those resources existed. It's amazing how sometimes our inability to see ourselves in a certain way limits the capacity of the church has to function as it should. So, ask the questions. What about our situation can we address? Begin to think about resources. And then, and only then, can I suggest, we start thinking about strategy. Um, now, I'm just going to put a list up here and we'll just talk briefly about them and uh, then I've got another slide or two after this I'm going to spend some time on but <clears throat> think about strategy first of all who do I know the good news is you really I my guess is practically everybody in this room with the possible exception of Carrie already has contacts no I don't mean that it just means you don't wear glasses anymore what I mean is you know people okay um, so how can I begin to think about making those spiritual contacts. They're already personal contacts, but can I just say, and you, you guys can disagree with me, your, your situation may be different, but I have had a lot of relationships with people before that were not spiritual relationships. It just, it just happens. It's just not the way it happened. I mean, we just, we had a shared activity or like work or something like that or, or whatever, and it just, we had relationships with them, but it wasn't a spiritual relationship. That relationship needed to be transformed. And sometimes it's that's the reason why I have kids at the, like they're not kids, they're college students, so they're not, they're, but they're not yet fully done either. You can get together a campaign group, take them to another city 30 miles away, and they will do stuff they will not do in their hometown. They'll talk to absolute strangers about Christ 
but they won't mention them to this person they went to high school with. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Part of it, I guess, is it's easier to be rejected by a stranger than to be rejected by a friend. Isn't that right, Chuck? Um, so maybe that's it, but what we need to do is begin to transform our contacts into spiritual contacts. Ask the question. I mentioned earlier, I've, I've tried to encourage some of our young people at college to begin incorporating what I call God talk into our regular conversations. Uh, the next time somebody gives you a compliment about something that you did well, say, you know, I'm just so thankful, for, thankful to God that He has permitted me to do this thing. Or what? Just start at times when you might be inclined to say, oh, really, it was nothing. Well, it's not nothing. It's something. What you want to say is it's not about me, and that's good. But if it's not about you, who is it about? Isn't it about God? So just start introducing that kind of talk in your conversations. Uh, how are you today? I am so blessed by God. Isn't it beautiful? You know, just find ways to introduce that. You're, you're, you're sowing some gent gentle seeds of spirituality into relationships formerly devoid of that spirituality. So, make contacts and make them spiritual contacts. Build relationships. It is very difficult to be truly influential in the life of a person who does not have any kind of relationship with you. Now, is, does it occasionally happen? Yeah. I mean, Philip brought the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ with no prior relationship. It occasionally happens. You may know of some people like that. But my guess is it happens very, very rarely. Relationship building is important. And there's a level of intentionality that I would urge upon you. Think about building a relationship because it gives you an opportunity to be spiritually influential. Build that into it from the very beginning or begin to transform those relationships from personal to spiritual. The third thing that you may want to think about is need meeting. A lady back here mentioned those who are uh, street people. You know, people. Boy, do those folks have needs. I mean, just go ahead and give you a warning right now. It's messy business. Messy not just because they're dirty and stink. It's messy because most of them have very dysfunctional lives and don't know how to have good relationships with other people. When we were back, back in Oklahoma, we had a bus ministry. We had two populations of people had feelings about that bus ministry. Some people absolutely loved it because it, made, it empowered them. It made them feel like they could really make a difference. The other half of the people were just kind of if, if, somewhere between tolerant and irritated about it because these kids came in, they didn't know how to behave themselves in church. Uh, they, they were disruptive sometimes. It's messy business inviting populations of people into your worship services. It's messy, but listen, I don't think the church assembly was really designed to be evangelistic. I may, I may rock the boat here, but our worship assemblies are for Christians. Okay? Um, that's not to say you shouldn't invite somebody to come, but I'm just saying if nothing is going on outside the worship service, I sometimes refer to vacuum cleaner evangelism. We throw open the doors of the church building, hope people just get sucked in off the streets. Uh, there's people in Slovakia who they tried. They, Slovakia is a country uh, predominantly Roman Catholic after the fall of, of communism. 87% of the people claim to be Catholic in the country, and so I would, I would try to start an evangelistic relationship with people, and they they were struggling some with their own sense of identity, and but. One thing they absolutely, there was something mysterious and wonderful they believed about Mass. Because after all, if you believe that Jesus Christ, this is not just a table, this is an altar. If you believe that Jesus, the priest is calling Jesus down to the altar again and He has been re-sacrificed, that's what a Mass does, by the way. Uh, if you believe that that happened, then that's a mystical and marvelous experience, isn't it? And so they would try to get me to just come with me to Mass. I think you'll understand why I am the way I am. And so I went occasionally and went and saw that. It did not have the same uh, uh, impact on me. So what makes you think that coming to your worship service is going to have the same impact on them it has on you? As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you it won't. Now, it could have an impact on them. I've had people leave there saying really nice things about our worship. The singing is beautiful, for example, or clearly those folks love one another. That's great. But unless there is relationship targeted toward meeting needs, you can't really expect that they're going to initially have much interest in you. See, we sometimes expect people to be spiritually mature before they're even spiritual. 
We expect them to understand why they ought to do this before they could possibly understand it. So before they can, you need to reach out and meet them on their territory. Meet their needs. That doesn't necessarily mean you've got to give people money. Their needs may not be financial. More likely their needs are emotional, uh, relational. And so ask, what can we do to meet people's needs? Any congregation that does not have a need meeting ministry of some kind is not, first of all, following the example of Jesus. And second of all, it's unlikely to be truly fruitful evangelistically. Now, we have to be careful with this one because if we're not careful, meeting needs can become an end in itself. It's not. A, people, a person can die hungry and saved and be blessed. A person cannot die full and lost and be blessed. So we need to keep the main thing the main thing. But meeting people's needs is a way of showing compassion. I think Jesus liked that idea, if I remember correctly. And we need also to be like that. Obviously, there needs to be evangelism. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. We've obviously focused a great deal on that and we're going to more uh, for, the, for the afternoon. <clears throat> there needs to be nurturing and maturing. This is the keeping aspect of what you guys are trying to do here. It's helping people to find their place in the body, to be supported and nourished, and, uh, and to grow toward maturity. And then there needs to be organic growth. I mentioned this one earlier. Find a place for people to fit. Help them to understand what their contribution is. <clears throat> we have developed a consumeristic mentality in our culture, and sometimes that translates into our churches. People come asking, what's in it for me? I tell you what's in it for me, cross-bearing. Ultimately, people need to grow till they realize that. Uh, Jesus, he didn't, he didn't mess with this. Hey, I'd like to be a follower. No, you, you really wouldn't. Because let me tell you what it's going to cost you. <laughs> Jesus was terrible at evangelism. Everybody knows you need to tell people how, much, how, how little this is going to cost them and how much they're going to gain. No. Uh, people need to be, uh, come to understand that there is a place for them here and that that place is a work. God has always selected for Himself a chosen, per chosen people. But that chosenness has never been about privilege. It's always been about responsibility. When God called the Jews, He wanted them to showcase His love to the rest of the world. Uh, they got the idea it was about privilege. Jesus reigned all over that. It's not about privilege. It's about being a part of something that is beyond you. Something bigger than you. Find a place for people to get involved. I think I'm going to challenge this church. I understand the biblically designated roles for men and women. I understand the process that says people need to grow a bit perhaps before they do certain things. I understand both of those. This church and all churches need to be challenged to ask, when this person becomes a Christian, how do they serve? And if you cannot come up with an answer to that, you had not completed your task yet. If, there, if you cannot come up with a place, that doesn't mean they're going to have to help wait on the Lord's table or lead singing or something like that, but is there work for this person to do? And what does that look like? Because part of the way that you approach them is to say, boy, have I got an opportunity for you. It's the most meaningful thing you'll ever be involved in, and this is what it's going to look like. At least for now. Maybe it'll look different later on. What's organic? I mean, this is a body after all. What part of the body is this person that you're talking to? Can you help them to find that spot? All right. <clears throat> So, let me just talk briefly about these. Is this my last slide? Yes. We might even have time for a question or two. Chuck, Chuck outdid me in this last session. He actually allowed time for questions. Made me look bad. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Um, listen. If we can really mean that this is not about us, and it's about God, then He needs to be right at the very center of this from the very beginning. The most powerful thing that you can do to stimulate evangelism is to pray. When Nehemiah becomes aware of the terrible condition of the wall of the city of Jerusalem, and he decides that he wants to be involved in making things better, the first thing he does is not to organize. First thing he does is not to act. The first thing he does is pray. We need to be a praying people. We're going to talk more about that 
uh, in our, first, our next session after lunch, I think. At any rate, we need to be praying people. But we also need to plan. Uh, the, the summary that I'll refer to Nehemiah again. I, I really like this illustration. The summary that Nehemiah gives or is given of Nehemiah and the people's work is that uh, after they, they prayed about this, the Bible says, and they completed the wall in 52 days for the people had a mind to work. Uh, they, they had a plan. You, you could see that laid out. Families and clans took certain sections of the wall and they rebuilt that and then all this is going on. They, they had to acknowledge the fact that there were threats as well. There were time periods where they worked with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. They had a plan and they worked that through. This third one on the list is something I want us to spend a little time talking about. <clears throat> Positioning. Um, this is related to the conversation we were having earlier when I asked, who do you know? And I'll ask it a little differently here. Where could you put yourself where you would be useful or where you could really make a difference? Is there a place you could position yourself? Now, I'm not talking about, well, I'll stand outside in the lobby before church. Now, I'm not talking about physical positioning here so much, though there may be an aspect to that. Uh, but in relation to other people, <clears throat> how do you position yourself? For example, um, you can position yourself as cooperative instead of oppositional with other people. I, I did uh, my PhD dissertation, a case study of a ministry called Let's Start Talking. Some of you may have heard of that uh, a ministry which basically goes to other places where people don't speak English as their native language and they teach them the Bible in English. I was interested in that because we did some of that in our work in Bratislava as well. But uh, one of their, one of their uh, strategies is what they refer to as the non-confrontational approach. Now there is a place for healthy confrontation. But until a relationship is more mature, that confrontation is more likely to be destructive than constructive. And so one of the things they say is, okay, you're reading through the Gospel of Luke uh, and you come to a particular place and they say, it looks like to me uh, that, uh, okay, well, let's, just, let's use the Gospel of John instead. Okay, you're, you're in the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Okay, great, perfect time to talk about baptism, right? Well, yeah, but... You may be talking to somebody who holds a very different point of view on that and your relationship, you're just in John chapter 3. This is early on. And so that person says, well, I understand that. You know, we practice sprinkling where I come from. Uh, and you think to yourself, I'm going to rip out the holy hand grenade. I'm going to blast them. <laughs> okay. Uh, they disagree with you. What are you going to do? Well, what you're going to do is you are going to preserve the relationship and move it forward. You may say something like, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, I'd like for us to talk about that somewhere a little further down the line, but right now I'd really like for us to take a look at the transformation that Jesus is able to have in the life of this man. Okay? Uh, you intentionally chose not to confront something that likely they are not ready. Your relationship is not of such substance that they're ready for that argument yet. Okay? So you choose a non-confrontational approach. You're positioning yourself intentionally in that way as an ally. You're a guide at the side. You're a fellow searcher. You can do that by saying things like, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to commit to you right now as we work our way through the Scriptures. If I find anything that is different from what I'm practicing as a Christian, I'm committed to change it. Would you be willing to make the same statement? And you know, what you're saying is we're all in this together. You've positioned yourself as a friend as a fellow student of the Word of God and not somebody who knows everything. So think about how you position yourself in relation to other people. Uh, are, you the, are you the captain of the debate team or are you somebody who really is, is desiring to serve? Your choice. Think about how you position yourself. But you might also ask, are there some activities where I could be? My friend Lane, when we were in Slovakia, his children were, uh, we didn't have any kids at the time, his children were uh, two and Five, I think. And in Slovakia, all women go back to work. They get two years maternity leave, but they all go back to work after that. Every single one of them. Everybody works outside the home. And so there's, they have what they call the Meterska Škola. Uh, it's a mother school, essentially. It's like preschool or some of these Mother's Day out kinds of things. Every child goes there. Well, Lane and, and April put their kids in a Meterska Škola several days a week. And Lane said, I got an idea. 
I can go 25, 30 minutes early and be there every day when parents are dropping off their kids and make conversation with them in the help, hope of developing some relationships. Well, he's positioning himself, isn't he? For the, for the purpose of evangelism. Ask, where could I be where there's a likelihood where I'd be able to spend some time with people that I could make a difference in their lives? So think about positioning some degree physically and geographically, but some degree emotionally and uh, ideologically, things of that nature. <clears throat> Here's the last one. Have you ever thought this, and certainly I'm sure you've heard somebody else say it if you haven't said it yourself. You know, I'm not much a one for conducting Bible studies. I'm just trying to be a good example. Okay. Well, I'm a big fan of being a good example. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, you just got to say something. Say something. You know, and here's a newsflash for you. We're not the only nice people that exist in the world. I'm not sure we can be so nice that people think, I'm going to drop what I'm doing right now and go and be with those people because they are so nice. There are nice people in all religious denominations. There are nice Muslims. There are nice atheists. You being a nice person is not going to complete the job. Say something. Now, you don't have to do what Carrie does every Sunday, stand up in front of large audiences of people and proclaim the God. You don't have to do it like that. Remember, this thing that the church was doing was evangelizing, gospeling, good newsing, just telling other people what Chuck said in the last session. You know, this is something that I found is really encouraging to me. I think it might be encouraging to you too. That, that doesn't, that's proclamation, but it's not that big public event that we sometimes associate with proclamation. Find your voice. Find a way in a way that's you. Be you. Don't quit being you. Don't be me. Perish the thought. Uh, be you, but be your best self. Be you in a way that gives you a voice to somebody else for the sake of Christ. Ask yourself, what does that look like? Certainly, uh, inviting people to activities where you know spiritual things are going to take place and where other spiritually oriented people are is something that you can do. But... Learn some, um, learn some sentences that open doors. Uh, what can you say that transforms an ordinary circumstance into a, an extraordinary spiritual situation? Let me take just a couple of minutes and ask for some of your ideas. Uh, there's a guy, I'll just, I'll, again, I'll prime the pump a little bit. There's a guy that I'm aware of <coughs> who tends to, uh, to uh, have more of a scientific point of view, he is known to have said uh, one time in a grocery store line, he said to the, to the person right there by him, you know the human DNA has more in common with a potato than it does a monkey? Now, I don't even know if that's right. <laughs> but, my, but my point is... My point is that it opened, like I said, I don't think the guy lied. Whatever he said, it may not have been exactly what I just said, but whatever he said changed the dynamic of that situation. It, are you kidding me? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think that human beings are created in the image of God, and that makes them different from any other animal. God has used a lot of raw materials to, to make a lot of different kinds of things. Anyway, just what are some things that you can do to open the door? Your turn. I don't know if it's really open the door or not because I think I've had a couple people not like it, but um, you ask people to come to worship and they say, Where is it? Do you have any chance to know where our building is up on Plains Lake? And they said, No, where is it? So I, I proceed to tell them where it's at. And then I'll say to them, We have a junkyard next door and a graveyard on the other side. I said, We're in the, that's where you are right now. That's where your car is going to end up, and the other side is where you live. Hmm, interesting. All right. Interesting. That's neat. I've never heard that one before. Of course, then again, again, there aren't that many buildings that are between junkyards and graveyards, so it's a very limited scope of usage for that particular approach. Yeah. 
And anything, anything that could potentially hurt has to be handled with care. I mentioned to, to Carrie other, uh, uh, a few minutes ago in, in context of another discussion that uh, you don't handle a chainsaw in the same way you handle a butter knife because <laughs> one of them is a whole lot more dangerous. But they both have their moments of, of usefulness, and so you need to be careful about the, We all need to be careful about the things that we, that we might say. And something will work really well for one person may not work for another. You have to gauge your audience. Some people like to be confronted. There's a guy that I uh, is in the congregation where I preach. If I'm not, I'm not much of the fire and brimstone type, but if I come across in a really strong way, very confrontational, I guarantee you that guy's going to come out and tell me that's the best sermon I've preached in a long time. He just likes to have his rear end kicked. Uh, some people like that. Other people, however, Anything that even smacks in any way of that kind of confrontational thing is offensive to them. So you measure, measure your audience and, and ask the kinds of questions that, that work. Other ideas, things you can say to start a conversation, a spiritual conversation? I told people that I, I was offended when they'd say Jesus Christ in response to something that they did. Mm. And um, it usually brings up a conversation and eventually they usually say, well, it's not a problem to me. I said, fine, just take it up with my big brother mm. and think about it. Again, measuring your situation and ask, is this going to come across as something that stimulates thinking or is it uh, something that, that could possibly push away? Carry first and then Chuck. Well, I've been sporadic in my application of it, but many times when we meet in at restaurants, I'll just say to the waitress after she takes the order, hey, we're going to pray for our food. Can we pray for you? And we have had people, I've had waitresses, when they got a moment, come back over to the table and say, you know, thank you for that. I've had them say, my husband's divorcing me. I've had them say, because it's non-confrontational to say, we're just going to pray for you. And if they say, no, everything's going all right, so then I just say, well, then we'll just pray for you. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's, I, I've even gone, when I've knocked doors places, I've, a couple times I've gone and just gone and say, We'd, we're just walking around praying with people. Do you have anything? Once or twice people have turned me down, but I get very little rejection for that. People who would never pray themselves, they still got needs and they're thinking, what could it hurt? You know, that's what they're thinking. I know it's much more than that, but that's what they're thinking. So yeah, that's a great idea, Carrie. But you have to leave a good tip if you do that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, listen, don't laugh. It's true. I mean, you cannot, you cannot claim to really care about them and then short them out on the tip. That, just, that sends a mixed message. They, you, I'll let you guess which one of the messages they got. Yeah. Chuck? Dale DeBernie, who we know preaches up in uh, Harbor Springs, Michigan, and uh, there's a, a, a congregation in Grayling who not too long ago had a preacher stand up and say, this is the way it's going to be. If you don't like it, I'm going to leave. And they said, you know, Unfortunately, it took about 10 people with them, a 30 member ish congregation. So Dale's been working with them, and uh, I've been blessed to go up a couple times on Tuesdays. And the last Tuesday I was up there, Dale and I went out to, to, to Oriental Place uh, to get some Chinese food. And the waitress was really nice. She, and, and so when we were finished, I, I asked her, I, I just said, Do you worship anywhere on Sunday? And then she was a, a, a monk. And so she went into some of her family and, and, and this stuff. And all I was trying to do was give Dale a chance to do follow-up down the road. Right. And so when she said, you know, difficult, she works on Sunday, I said, well, let me ask you a question. I'd love to hear this from people. What is it that you do that draws you closer to God? I, I, I love to ask people that because I, I want that. Mm -hmm. And she thought, well, I don't, well. And then she said, my family. And just gave her a chance to respond. Yeah. Because, again, like here, can I help you? Can I ask you? Yeah. Uh, when Michelle and I were traveling back from Texas, we were holding hands and praying, and, and the waitress had brought our food, so we were just holding our hands. And, and I said, through Jesus, amen. The waitress, I didn't know she was behind me. She said, oh, amen to that. Mm-hmm. You know, and, yeah. and just these little things that we do, again, we're the sweet smelling aroma. Sometimes it's a visual that gives them this opportunity. And it's non confrontation. Remember, guys, I believe with all my heart that there is a God shaped hole in the human psyche that seeks to be filled. Mm -hmm. Give people an opportunity to be spiritual. Ask the question. I, I've just been known to ask do you, are, are you a spiritually minded person? You know, most people believe that they are. 
They may, not have, they may not have had a religious experience of any structured sort in years, but they think about things like that. They care. Uh, ways of talking with people. Uh, you know, when you start a conversation about how, how rough the world is these days, almost everybody believes it is. Wonder why that is. Gives you an opportunity to say, you know, I believe there's just too little of God in the affairs of this world. You can have a conversation about that. All right, we're out of time. But I appreciate very much your willingness to get engaged in this conversation.